You are listening to Hainai by Motsi Dapu, episode 16.5, Mouse, the story of Nessie Smith. Here was a little woman, known to few as Nessie Smith, for few knew her. She had few friends, and her branch of the family was small and dignified, and exactly nothing else. The best they could say of their household's only daughter was that she was an educated woman, and could therefore tend to the matters of the house when her parents were no longer able. She was of small stature, plain of face but for the spectacles that rested on her little nose, and her presence was hardly noted. She was not skilled enough to be invisible, but not consequential enough to be special, and hadn't the aptitude to contribute to Savard's great ideals and grand plans. If you ask Nessie Smith, young, mousy, plain, sometimes clumsy, and without any potential to speak of. She would at least say she believed in the cause. She was there in the room, same as the rest, when Savard took the first life, a poor drunk from the gutter, whose gurgles and death rattles echoed in her nightmares. She knew what power he held, and believed that such power could achieve great things in their world, which when broken down to its barest essentials, was growing smaller and smaller as progress and industry grew. She could not contribute to Savard's magical machinations, but she had a sharp eye for industrial machinery. If she had the gall to bring it up to Savard, that he could perhaps combine the two into something more powerful, she would have perhaps held some esteem As it was, she could barely speak up for herself among her peers, who spent their days treating Savard's meetings like country club soirees. A woman named Catherine took the little mouse under her wing, allowing her the safety of friendship, but speaking over her at every turn. When Grigory and his ilk moved against their leader, Nessie wondered what might have happened if she had fallen into his crowd, but she knew from the beginning that their ambitions were much too dangerous for one such as her. She knew, of course, of Marianne Weeks. Nobody could miss the woman in Savard's inner circle, and though Nessie once wished to speak with her, recognizing a scientific mind and a possible ally, Catherine assured her lot that none of them would ever lower themselves as to converse with the novelty called Weeks, Savard's favorite pet project. So Nessie never did. So Nessie never did. Not even when Marianne pulled away from the Ordo after Grigori, Renard, and Langford's coup. Not even when Marianne died. And so, in the ordo led by one of the most charismatic and powerful men she had ever met, Nessie Smith remained unnoticed and forgotten, and would have continued to remain such, if not for that night. She left the book at the ordo's meeting place, and wished to retrieve it the very same night, without alerting anyone. She entered the back way, finding her blind way through the dark, until she arrived at the sitting room, where the book lay abandoned on a nearby table. She was distracted from her path back by the flicker of lamplight, and the muttering of a familiar voice that startled her when it suddenly rose in volume, and she saw Savard's shadow, loom tall at the very end of the hallway. Sure she had been spotted, she approached quietly, slowly. She would ask for his forgiveness for the trespass, 
wish him a better night than she believed he was having. She did not see how his shadow lengthened against the wall, and did not notice the heat until she saw its source, a table partly burning, the effigy of little buildings, what she recognized as Toronto, recreated in great detail, a portion of it eaten away by a controlled flame that she assumed was Savad's magic. The great, towering figure of Savard bent over the flames, his mutterings a constant stream. He seemed not to take notice of her until she knocked into a wall, trying to step back into the retreating shadow. His eyes were wild when they found her. But he stood to full height so slowly and with such care that it frightened her more. His face was cast in the shadow of the fire, but his eyes were like bright lanterns in the dark, never once taking them off her as he approached. Though she breathed, it was like she could not take in air as he stood over her. She froze as his hands rested upon her shoulders. He called her Little Mouse, a familiar name whispered among the few who called themselves her friends. He asked her who she spied for, who sent her to him to be crushed underfoot or poisoned and destined to die in the walls of this house. She held the book up in front of her like an ineffectual shield, apologized over and over, tears welling up in her eyes. Never had she experienced such terror in her life as when the great Savard trapped her as much with his gaze as his strong, grasping hands, fingers coming to rest behind her neck and thumbs crossed at her collarbone. If you were anyone else, he said with finality, you would be dead. Run along, little mouse. And he let her go. She sobbed and stumbled all the way home, scraping her knees and breaking her spectacles when she tripped over cobblestones in the dark. Her book was stained with gutter water, and her welcome home was not a warm one. A day later... She heard the news. A great fire that many feared would spread to other parts of the city, but by the blessing of one god or another, remained only in the district it began. A district, rather, a slum. It happened in the night and killed many before the firefighters could tend to it. The numbers were countless, for those who lived in the ward were countless. Though a majority survived, there must have been death by the hundreds. She remembered Savard and his wild eyes, and too long shadow, and the fire burning away behind him. Out of sheer curiosity, and a boldness she could not have anticipated in herself, Nessie came calling, to the Savard household. She was turned away at the door, told the family was grieving. The sudden loss of the household's eldest son, Savard's eldest son, one William Savard II. There was no indication that she was being singled out. The tragedy seemed genuine, and Savard could see no one. Weeks went by, and there was only silence. Members of the Ordo meeting in their hallowed halls without their leader present. Managing the affairs of his household and the funeral for his lost son, said Richard Henry, 
another of his inner circle. And then, Savard, swiftly and suddenly, abdicated his role as leader. He was never heard from again after that. And that was when all hell broke loose. When it came to desperation, Nessie found herself making choices she never would have made in comfort and complacency. But it seemed she was as much a mouse as they said, or more aptly, a clever rat, because she saw Catherine and her faction as the sinking ship that they were. In the dead of night, once more, but without the threat of a looming, powerful man, Nessie snuck into the Ordo's hallowed halls and entered Savard's abandoned study. She looked upon the burnt-up husk of the ward on his untouched, dust-coated diorama as she gathered up his books, his notes, all that he had left with his sudden abdication and disappearance. She studied his notes, no mind for magic, but nonetheless intelligent enough to make some sense of his many plans, designed in tandem with his right-hand men and woman. And as one who loved modern technology and the spirit of industry, she understood perfectly well the concept of fuel and power sources, and how burning them powered greater machinery. The mystery of hundreds dead, weeks before Savard's disappearance, was no longer so much of a mystery then. All that was left for Nessie to do was to use her leverage, and she knew Catherine's faction would waste her knowledge, just as easily as they had wasted her chance to speak to Marianne, one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful, of the Ordo, for lazy bigotry. So instead, she turned to one Giuliano Bartolotti, handsome, sharp, Ambitious, he may not have fallen in with Savard's inner circle, but Savard seemed to respect his charm and hunger. Hunger for knowledge, for power. He was the first to act the day Grigori attempted to move against Savard, adept at a spell of burning blood that seared Grigori down to his boots. Even without magic, Bartolotti had power and influence on his side. He had been courting an heiress of obscene wealth for months the day Nessie Smith came to his door, presenting Savard's plans to him and asking for a partnership. He announced his plans to marry Nessie Smith, not two weeks later, heiress be damned. An odd pair they made, certainly, and many rightly guessed that it was more a transaction than a whirlwind romance full of love and affection. Not that she did not love her husband. It was easy to love a man so charming, so handsome, so pragmatic. And in his own way, he seemed to love her as well. She asked only for his protection and resources, and he was the one who suggested the marriage. What's mine is yours, and yours mine, he had said, eyeing Savard's notes with a familiar hunger. All he wanted from her was in her hands, not in her face or heart. But it was nice enough to have a husband who was quite enamored by her sharp mind and encourage her to speak up, wishing to hear the ideas of one whose mind worked like the gears in a machine and understood them just as easily. He was not content to have her be quiet and afraid. He wanted her to blossom, become useful, as the investment he put into having her as his wife. And so, Vanessa Bartolotti grew into herself, buoyed by the confidence of her husband and her own growing ambition. For was she not the only member of the Ordo to take Savard's closely guarded secrets and use them to her own benefit? When many came to Giuliano Bartolotti's doorstep, 
looking for an ally in the struggles for power Savard had left in his wake, or to challenge him for the magic and material wealth he had gathered when the order fractured. Juliana laughed, known to say, Let me ask my wife, before shaking hands, or leaving no trace but ash of their visitor on his doorstep. They lived a good long life, the two of them. Juliana was an amorous man, desire for his wife stoked as he saw the mouse that his wife came to him as become one of the former Ordo's most calculating, vicious predators. She did not hesitate when he made to kill their old allies, not even when Catherine Rowland invited them out to sea, thinking she could dispatch them easily for the power and secrets they possessed only to herself be lost in the icy mist to the end of her days, which were still yet to come. Vanessa advised her husband often on how to deal with each of the members left after the initial chaos of Savard's abdication, and she was almost always right. In turn, Juliana almost always listened to her. It was when the benefactor, with the support of Richard Henry, rose in power, that their luck began to shift. Vanessa knew every member of the Order by name, but the benefactor was a frightful exception. His spell made their memory slide off him like water on stone. His name couldn't come to mind, his face and form but shadows in the eyes of his erstwhile allies. But his power? His power was far beyond any of them had ever achieved, and the method by which he came upon his power was familiar to none but Vanessa herself. Seared into her mind were the eyes, the fire, the hands on her shoulders, around her neck. The great man who had made her weep like a frightened child the night he took hundreds of lives, then disappeared forever. Until, of course, the benefactor surfaced. For no memory spell could drive the thought of Savard from Vanessa's memory. It was no coincidence that the benefactor was doing just as he did all these years later. She could not show her hand, not in this, especially with how every one of their allies and enemies fell to this benefactor. She and her husband met with Richard Henry once or twice. The first time, they refused his offer of alliance. The second time, years later, when they were ten elders poorer, and the benefactor's faction had a much larger body count than their own. They agreed, but no contract signed or hands shaken could stop the mouse from avoiding traps, nor could they stop her from planting her own. So the Bartolotis pored over what they had left of Savard's notes, and they learned of a place that was a dream, that was a world, that was a power source. A power source to a great machine that only lived in Vanessa's dreams, until Giuliano wished to make it a reality. They began to collect foci all around the city, both active and defunct. With the tools at their disposal, they began to build Vanessa's grand machine, a hall of nightmares, endless staircases, doors to the deaths of innocents, whose souls were fed to greater purpose. They were ready, Juliana had said, confident, where Vanessa still had doubts, calculations that didn't line up, magic that seemed ill-suited to her own. He did not listen when she told him not to set the great gears of her machine into motion. 
he did not listen when he made the smallest crack into the veil that parted worlds. After that, what was left of Giuliana Bartolotti, well, Vanessa had her very own nightmare to tend to her great machine. It was a good thing her husband had so much land to his name. Otherwise, she would have had so much more to explain to anyone who wandered too close to the miasma of bleeding magic caused by a crack that never should have been created and could not be closed by her own power. Nobody could survive Vanessa Bartolotti's great machine. Those unlucky enough to wander into it would simply have to disappear, no matter her pity for their misfortune. And more so than magic, money did a great job turning suspicion away from her when nobody could find bodies on her grounds, which was why the familiar face of a charlatan alongside hapless policemen that had wandered into her workshop surprised her. When they survived the ordeal, her own husband, an immortal with powers cultivated over decades, hardly could. She had so many questions still. And now, perhaps she had answers, along with a possible ally, whose wild magic achieved something the elders' structured spells never could. An ally that could help her finally take down her other ally. The Benefactor, or as she knew him, William C. Savard. Yo, what's up there, babes and hotties? We're best served hot, and we're here to spill the tea on the hottest celebrity and influencer news in Toronto. Biggest news of the day is Vanessa Bartolotti herself. There's been buzz about a collab between her and spiritual wellness expert, our favorite Chinatown local guru, Mahadev, since she liked one of his shop's IG posts in the past week. But going off recent news, could a collab mean something else? A change in lifestyle for the Life and Style Summer Skincare Ambassador? Or a hit at her closely guarded personal life with a guru of low-key living? Phoebe's been seen hanging around a mystery hottie that many of our sources are speculating as a brand new beau she keeps hinting on at her socials. Could our lady be single and ready to mingle or keep her private life private until she's ready to show her boy off? We'll keep you posted as long as she keeps us in the loop. You're listening to Hainai by Motsi Dapul. <laughs>